Well, good morning, and um, I guess my goal here today is just kind of give insight to where things are going as relates to this, what we describe as the kind of digital evolution of ag. Um, probably won't cover all things, but but at least give you some some indicators of where things may be heading as relates to data and some of the technologies that uh, that will be available to to folks. Uh, this just kind of this summarizes uh, where we're kind of at in the U.S. as it relates to precision ag. Uh, as we look at variable rate again across the U.S., um, majority of the retailers, co-ops, and third-party kind of service providers. Uh, it's a pretty high level, plus 80% that offer these type services, precision ag type services, just beyond hardware. I'm talking about services that bring prescriptions, information, and those things to the, to the farm, uh, to the field level, actually. But when we look at fertilizer and lime, uh, adoption is pretty high by farmers. We know verberate seeding continues on a, an upswing, okay? It may not a you know a, a high level of increase per se in terms of when you look at the tangent, but the point is, verberate seeding and the number of prescriptions made is continues to increase across the U.S. And more recently, in the last couple of years, is this notion of doing verberate soybeans. Uh, it seems like that's a hot topic, um, but uh, the idea here is that there are soybean prescriptions being made, and we look at numbers. That's again increasing over time here. So nothing new necessarily, but uh, just some ideas that this is, these are, uh, we're moving more towards type prescription type uh, activities, prescriptions putting into fertilizer and inputs, okay, and it continues to increase. And then what I'm going to spend most of my day on is, is uh, and talk here is, is this last thing, and I call them digital tools. You can talk about digital technologies. Uh, you get a few companies down here that, that I would, um, suggest they're, they're playing a significant role in this advancement of digital ag uh, and we're seeing use of these tools okay and again it may be of low adoption but the idea here is the opportunity for growers or for companies to engage growers with these technologies continue to increase and I'm assuming out here that uh, that's that's in play uh, whether it's with climate deer or, or some of these others that people are starting very slowly or through their service providers starting to utilize these tools to some degree, okay? So, with that said, I wanna spend a few minutes on this slide. When I look at what's happening in the US, these are, these are the players as I talk about it, and I'm not excluding anyone, but I'm just talking this maybe a little more of a Midwestern flavored slide, but these are the folks that are really playing in the whole digital piece today. And uh, the size of those logos are indicative of their influence or ability to continue and have a big influence, okay? So DTN, John Deere, FBN still is out there, Farmers Business Network is being provided. Uh, Cortiva, of course, slash Pioneer with, with their suite. Uh, Indigo. I don't know where things are here in this neck of the woods with Indigo, but I know in Ohio that a lot of lar larger farmers are signed up with them in the last couple years. They seem to continue down the path of not just uh, as a startup, but really they've been hiring a lot of people, at least in Ohio and Indiana that, that I've been around and been surprised with uh, the hirings they've made, but uh, seem to be someone that, that are really starting to play in this space of kind of this digital space. Uh, some things, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but EFC Systems, they're out of Tennessee. They've been around a long time, but in the last few years, what they've been able to do is uh, they basically acquired Ag Junction at one point and basically developed what it's described as a field analytics tool, which is very similar, kind of like SMS, if you think of it that way, but it's an FMIS platform that they've now integrated into their ERP system, which has been their main business, is basically the back end of invoicing and such for the retail sector. Now they got this precision ag platform. Uh, I say that, and I'm out here advocating on, on what they're doing, but they're one of few companies out there really start doing development work, trying to expand that platform. They're actually spending a lot of dollars making new capabilities. Um, and, and then they've done what others have. You take Pioneers, everyone know what Pioneer, you take, they've, always, they've had this in circuit product, but what, is, 
What did Pioneer slash Cortiva invest in here recently? What platform did they buy? Granular. Granular, right? And so all of a sudden you got kind of their precision ag platform. You got granular that's a, not necessarily precision ag, but kind of this ERP logistics and thing, trying to bring that together. And that brings me to this. When you look at what's happening, these functionalities and the way we're going to interact in the future or starting to interact today in some cases is if you're just an FMIS platform, a farm management information system, SMS, okay, you know, and I'm not picking on Ag Leaders SMS in my discussion here, but if you think that I'm going to be out here providing just FMIS and that's going to be my primary back-end software, today you got to be more than that. you got to be more than that. And so what you're seeing, using Corteva as an example and some of these others, is I got my FMIS that now today has to have imagery embedded in it whether that farmer's buying it or not, but it has to already have imagery coming into it. I'll, I'll make that comment. But it's got to have this back-end ERP system or similar type kind of system. Granular would be an example. And then within all this I've built in is this ability, whether it's locally or regionally or potentially nationally, to do benchmarking. That's a, that's a, a real focus. So gives the capabilities of farmer to, if they so choose to do benchmarking, there's a couple platforms up there you can point to that provide that today. And then what's happening and hasn't quite made the step is the integration of IoT, okay, the Internet of Things, connecting devices to the Internet, but those, the information coming from those are coming into that platform. So as a grower or a consultant, you go into one platform, all these things, capabilities are all in this one platform just not doing precision ag, making prescriptions, viewing maps. That's kind of the past. Today, as a company, I've got to be offering all things specifically to growers. That's what's happening today in the industry, at least how I would describe it. Okay? So that's kind of uh, where things are heading, or in some cases are already being built and available. Uh, of course, we know climate now is under the Bayer umbrella. Syngenta probably can make that a little bit bigger. Uh, they continue to, to push forward and do some things in the digital ag space, okay? And again, I, there's probably others I could throw up here. These are just ones that are primarily seem to be at the forefront, and, and at least in Ohio, you hear about consistently. Probably I can get that list down to three pretty quick, okay? From that, that's this is what we're kind of heading that torch. I mean, there's not a company out there today that doesn't have something like this on their website, the Connected Farm. And this has been around. And so let's work through this a little bit, okay? Number one, when I th think about the industry, I'm just presuming, regardless of age or something, majority of people, even here today, are carrying something like this. Everyone in agreement to that? We know that, that regardless of where, what state I go to in the U.S., Someone, regardless of the age, they're going to have a smartphone, iPad, or tablet accessible to them. And you could say that what I would prescribe to is they can do business or they do business with that device as it relates to farm. That could be simply as making calls, texts, and doing emails. But today, you know, with apps and other things, you can do a lot more. And the number of apps being offered in the ag industry is exponentially growing year by year. Okay? So, my point in all that is, the people in ag are connected today. The people in ag are connected today. <coughs> Secondly, when you look at it, you look at all these machines, okay? The machines in agriculture today are connected. If you purchase a, a new tractor, a harvester, combine, cotton picker, sprayer today, guess what's already in that machine? A modem cell phone based modem that connects when that runs off the end of the production line guess what it's on and it's connected okay so in that scenario the people are connected the machines are connected the last and third leg of this is trying to get the field connected okay and that's where these IOT devices and things start to come in but that will complete this picture is we got the machines we got the people that are either there or remote, and now we're trying to connect 
and probably some of you have felt this already, there's companies that for low cost or even free of charge will give out a, a weather station. Guess where that weather station needs to be? Two things. It's got to be positioned at the farm, typically at minimum the headquarters, and secondly, what is that, that what's required of that? It's got to be connected to the internet. Has to be. So there's things like that already happening. You know, we look at some of the soil moisture, and I'll get back to some other IoT devices here in a little bit, or at the end of this, but my point is it's coming pretty quick, and it's pretty amazing some of the back-end technology that's going to be available here in the near future. The only issue, the only issue that we're living in as relates to that right now is rural connectivity. I would prescribe to the idea if we had rural connectivity across the U.S. today, my comment was it's game on. It is game on because that changes everything immediately with a flip of a switch. But the fact is, even in Ohio as I go, we got some areas that are still kind of covered 3G, 4G. We got this 5G thing coming in around the big cities, you know, not really readily available to ag yet, but could be a game changer. But my point is when rural connectivity, when we saw that, this becomes very real, very quick. Okay? So that's where we're heading and, and kind of kind of framing all this up. Of course, apps and, and these devices is how we're going to interact with all that going on. Okay. With that is this idea, and I just kind of getting you to think about is the day or the farmers have to start thinking about how do I share data? How do I share data? to get services back or um, be participants in programs, whatever that is. How do I share data? In the future, I would tell you is, farmers are gonna have to share data amongst multiple organizations to bring things back, services back, information back, recommendations back, whatever that is. This is just kind of a, a look ahead of sharing data and getting something back in return, okay? Whether that's paid for or embedded in the products they buy, okay? But the idea of data sharing is not easy today. If you all have been around the precision ag business, sharing of data is a pretty tall feat. It is painful, okay? And so we continue to advance, we continue to grow. It's a slow process. It's better than day was it yesterday, but it by far is a, is a painful thing in the industry. With that, I want to show you this. This is a project we did a couple years ago because we were really challenged with, everyone talks about data. Probably get all of you to talk about data. It's like, well, what are you talking about? What data? What is that data? What's it look like? What formats that data in and how can I use it? Some of us, we just see data, we just see it in an app, right? But do we really know what data is in behind that? What we did was we took a 100 acre field at Nate Doritas' farm. This is Nate, young man. Um, and we collected on a 100 acre field, Trey Colley's sitting there, and we basically, we had fun, uh, it was all on Twitter, we basically looked at Terra and we just collected all the data from the commercial products that Nate is using on the farm today. These are, again, products that probably some of you are already using. We just kind of encapsulated and took all everything that Nate's using to try and figure out what actually was collected and what format and how usable that data was to Nate. Because to that point, no one had really taken on that. I think we guesstimate. Sure, that's kind of useful, that's not. That's valuable, that's not. We're just kind of guesstimating. Anyone, 100 acre field, any ideas of how much data was collected in one growing season? One growing season for a 100 acre field using the commercial products out there. Any ideas? A few megabytes, a few gigabytes, a few terabytes, no one, no one? You know, what's a byte? Yeah. You know? That one corn plant that those guys are sitting there, we contributed 18.4 gigabytes of data to. That individual plant, to some degree, no one with the technology when it was put in the ground, how it was put in the ground with all the planter technology collecting data, one single plant we could contribute 18.4 gigabytes of data to. You project that over the whole field or how we collected all that data, we almost had 2,500, we had 
almost 2,500 unique files on that 100 acre field. You think about that. Who in here wants to manage 2,500 unique files? 39 different file types. Majority of those file types are pr proprietary. Proprietary, not open source, not, but are proprietary in nature. I just listed some of the common ones maybe some of you deal with on the right side. There's, there's what, 39 of them I could list out there. And look at the bottom down there. A 100 acre field collected over 60 petabytes of data for a 100 acre field over one growing season using the products that we're all using, sitting here using today. Now, everyone in here knows what a petabyte is, right? Anyone knows what a petabyte is, Dave? We did it. We did not know what a petabyte was until we got to this. Huh? It's a lot. It's a thousand terabytes. It's a thousand terabytes. So we got 60 plus thousand terabytes of data on a 100 acre field in one year. 39 different file types, almost 2,500 unique files, and you wonder why we're having issues in the ag industry of getting access to data, using access, and a lot of people use the word, what's the value? Well, we haven't even got some of the baseline information things right first. How are we gonna get the value built into it when we have all this scenario going on? Does that make sense? Of this, of this, I would say there's two questions that everyone should be answered. And this answers for Nate because this is really interesting. There's two questions we all should be sitting here thinking about. John, you got 60 petabytes. Let's keep it round number, 60 petabytes. What percentage of that data was readily accessible to Nate to use on his farm to inform decisions, verify things, or use in some capacity? That'd be pretty important to know. There's 60 petabytes of data coming in somehow from all these platforms, but what was available to him to actually use in that growing season and make use of it? Less than 25%. What that tells you is a lot of this stuff that comes in, regardless of company, is I've got to have a specialized software, potentially. I've got to download that, that file and have something to read it in order to make, make use of that. And who's going to do that sitting here in the room? Maybe you as consultants, as part of maybe your business, is to have to deal with that. But a farmer's not going to do that, or is it? The other question that you should be asking is, at the end of this growing season, we sat down with the two consultants, Nate and everyone involved in the project, and asked one very valuable question, and that, what is the value of the data to Nate? What percentage of that data, 60 petabytes? Folks, I had almost six external hard drives to store this stuff. Not cloud services, because they couldn't handle it, but external hard drives. What percentage of that data was valuable to, date, to Nate at the end of the season? Any guesstimates in here? 10%. 11%. 11%, he could contribute something where he used it to either verify something and went on on his farm and he felt good, I'm continuing on with my plan, or I used to make, in this case, a fungicide application, a fertilizer application in season based on the data, those kinds of things. 11%. Less than 25% of that data is available to him to use. And it was basically 10, 11 percent, however you want to round it, that was actually valuable in some fashion to him. What happened to all the other 90 percent? It just sits there, rests, and never gets used. So that's one project uh, just to, to throw out, to think about. That's kind of where we're at today. Of course, most of us are never going to see these numbers behind. But there's a lot of things I think this project, at least for us, highlighted about, about limitations, issues, and then ultimately value behind the scenes. Real quickly, what's digital technologies? This is our definition. You can choose to use. Very simply, I want to show you a couple slides here that we did a, a project on. Um, digital technologies and other things, you have, to, you have to submit data to to get something back. Very simple. Digital, that's what we used. 
Anyone to speculate how many digital technologies are out in North America today? Probably most of us could sit here and list, what, half dozen, dozen maybe. You can say, yeah, that's digital technology. I, I submit, pretty easy to see that. Two years ago, it's 111 companies in North America offering digital technologies. Now for us, we just kind of broke them down to understand what they were doing. Data warehousing, production analysis, benchmarking, in-season monitoring, crop modeling, nitrogen models would be an obvious one for most of us. And those that provide recommendations, prescriptions, okay? That's just kind of the breakdown of what's out there. You notice there's quite a bit up here in this data warehousing perspective. So a lot of people are trying to warehouse data, okay? It's kind of interesting. But my point is there's a tremendous amount of investment. I always like to put out we're still in the billions of dollars of ag tech investment. If you haven't looked in the 19 numbers, we're, we're still in billions of dollars and expected to continue to have billions of dollars invested in the ag tech industry in the future, okay? So there's still this, this behind the scenes involvement of digital ag, a lot of that being funded by investors at the billion dollars of investment, okay? Just to bring forward. From that, if you heard me talk yesterday, this is the same survey where I told you 84% of the farmers were we're doing on-farm research. We did this survey, and we basically are only asking farmers that are using precision ag. So I want to highlight that. These are only farmers using precision ag type stuff. Of that, 92% of that population that we surveyed are sharing data external to the farm today. Let me put that in a simple manner. Taking a yield map and I'm sending it to you for whatever reasons. They are sharing data outside the farm. Think about that, folks. I don't know what's happening here. I know a lot of people do things all in-house, but in terms of these progressive farmers, 92% are sharing something outside their farm as it relates to data. Our goal in this project to understand where we're going to be in five years, expectations on how farmers are going to interact with data, to me that starts to tell you where we're headed. 66% of them are actually sharing with two or more, and if you're selling seed, or you're an agronomic consultant, you're the trusted advisor in this deal. You're up here, the rest of us, including someone like me in Extension Academia, are clear down here. But in terms of who they're sharing that data with, it's a seed person and a consultant. So if you're sitting in that business, you're at this point looked at as, as a very highly trusted advisor as it relates to those, that data. Okay? But 92% already sharing beyond the farm gate, the farm operation. Just think, be thinking about that. And they have very high or high expectations that that data is going to be valuable to them. I would have that similar expectation if I was giving someone data, right? You, you expect something that you're going to make me money or improve my farm operation from that data. So that's kind of where I think this explains or, or gives some evidence of where things are heading fairly quickly. What are trends? We're going to talk through these sensors being connected to the internet and in this data thing. These are three. There's other things. I wrap automation around all that. We're doing a lot of work in automation. What the business model is, what's the machinery look like, how, is, how do we deal with things, how do we, what does it need to look like in the future. But it's these things that are, you're seeing a lot of those billion dollars of investment go into is these things as relates. Here's the current tractor, planter configuration, okay, I can interact with both of those with a, an iPad, right? I can, or my smartphone, I can watch those, I can interact with those. This is one example, okay? I want to show you this on the next slide. But my point is, this is connected to the internet, this planter's connected to the internet, that's a 40-foot planter, 16-row corn planter, that's 16 one-row planters. That's not a 16 row planter anymore. We're individually controlling not only downforce, but other things on that per, on a per row basis. That's how it's being implemented. That machine right there has artificial intelligence built into it, if you didn't know that. So these things are kind of here. I'm not here to advocate that everyone run out and buy technology. That's not what I'm saying. My point in this, and when I show you the video, I just want you to highlight what our capabilities are today. The capabilities. But again, I can watch those, and it was out running today, if Andrew, um, that this is, this, is, this is real. Here's one of our, uh, uh, we'll talk about this for a little bit, one of our um, 
uh, projects or you know, I'm out here advocating just to highlight capabilities. This is plant and corn, about 34,000 seeds per acre at what speed? He says eight miles an hour. Any other guesstimates? 12, 15. What well, if I told you 17 and a half mile an hour? What's our road cleaners used for at that? Yeah, it's like a tornado, right? Got a tornado behind that machine pushing it. Let me tell you, folks, here's my comment on this. Again, I want to be very clear. I'm not here advocating. I'm just telling you what, what's, what's capable. And you can go to our eFields book. I'll show you that at the end and look at the results of this over two years. But given the conditions, I know that's going to be, you know, a question. But I'm going to tell you right now the technology works. That can simulate corn basically at 33, 34,000 at 17 and a half miles an hour and can do it pretty effectively. Okay, some people are asking me, I'll, t I'll be the first to admit, simulation pretty well maintained at that speed. You give up a little bit on seed spacing. So if you're the pick a fence person and you're thinking that way, you're going to degrade a little bit, but not significantly, and it's not going to hurt your yield. But it can do it. My point is the technology works. Every row is independently being controlled in there. And the first thing, a lot of people will be thinking, well, geez, you know, when that thing's going at that speed, it looks like to me that thing's just jumping around all them row units. Bring me back and I'll show you data that would suggest otherwise. It is not that significant different than if that machine is going at five, five and a half miles an hour. It's not like it's just bouncing. It's amazing, folks, what down pressure or down force does at that kind of speed and the response it can provide to something like that. Again, I'm out here advocating everyone go out and purchase this stuff. This stuff's available today. I'm just highlighting that's our capabilities. Anyone notice how big a tractor was pulling that 40-foot planter? Huh? 250. Nope. 250 he says. 400. 500 horse tractor. When did y'all think that you would need a 500 horse tractor, 40 foot planter? We just connected whatever we needed on the farm, right? Whatever tractor was available, we connected the planter, regardless of size, and we'd pull it, right? I'm going to tell you right now, the year prior we had a 400 horse quad track on that 16 foot planter. Shut her down. Shut her down in some conditions. So just getting you to think, but the point is this can be done today. From that, this isn't anything new. I, we can collect all this as planted data. You know, that's a downforce map. You can get your singulation map, population map. I mean, to some degree. If you really think about it, we can almost map every single seed where it ends up to some degree, all right, by row. Of course, in this map, I've got a, a downforce map, and what you see here, interesting enough, is surface compaction cropping up. The planner tells us, or told us, we have a project, and we actually have surface compaction. Guess when that was induced? Prior harvest, okay? And so all of a sudden, i got data now that's... that's um, indirectly indicating issues out in that field. We had a nitrogen project. I tell this story all the time, a nitrogen project in that field. Do you think compaction is going to impact emergence and ultimately yield potentially in that field? Absolutely. That's going to be a, what we call a co-variable for that. But if I didn't know that and I put all my nitrogen strips in, could I make an erroneous, you know, basically result out of this not knowing the compaction was underlying some of the issues that we saw out there? Absolutely. So my point is, again, we've got a lot of data. This is as planted, agronomic type data, or what we describe as that. It's a bunch of it. We also have this machine data being collected. For those of you that are either using the puck or have a John Deere, even Case now, this is the data flowing off of these tractors, these machines. And very simply, as you look across the bottom, this is a, a third party piece plugged into the diagnostic report, uh, port. When you see, we're, we're basically planning 10.4 miles an hour, a project. We're 84% engine load. 
we're burning 18 point, or basically 18 gallons per hour at that speed right there. And this is all being collected with GPS coordinates behind the scene. Again, how many of you are using this data today? But it's being collected. Maybe some of you. I'm just saying that we're, a lot, we're very socialized to this day if you're using some of the products. But at the same time, depending on what you're using, this is also being collected. Okay? What basically I'm getting you to think about is that these are IoT devices. And it's the same thing for all of you that are wearing a Fitbit today. It's the same thing. It's here. We can put it on the machines or the machines already have it. And, and basically looking at performance and having to be able to collect that and give some summary out at the back end. Okay? So we can begin to tie actual costs to fields or subfield type level activities. I would just prescribe just getting to the field level would be something that we'd like to know in some cases. So that's kind of where we're at. I'm going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence because I guess it's kind of like where's this whole digital thing going? I'm going to give you some examples of that. Uh, weeding is a big thing around the world. This whole labor issue, especially, especially crops, horticultural type crops is real. If you go to Agritechnica, you would see these devices. But again, this is a this is a, an automated robotic weeder. You notice it's got everything on it. They work at fairly small speeds. You could go buy this today if you so choose. About $100,000, give or take. Expensive. I mean, we all sit in here. There's like no way would I want to go out and buy that. But I always tell you, what happened if it was thirty-five or forty thousand? And you think about what you're paying for employees to do some of this per se. I'd say that changes the, the you know, perspective pretty quick. We're heading down that avenue, right? These things will be cheaper. For example, y'all, Christmas is getting pretty close. Go out and look at a device called TerraTill. Anyone ever seen TerraTill? T A R A T I L L. You know, what was it, two years ago, three years ago, the, the automated sweeper was a big Christmas gift, it was one of the top gifts. Well, now we got TerraTill, which is basically a, a little autonomous robot weeder. It's about that big. You throw out in your, your beds and your, around your house, and it goes around and weeds, weeds your things. Somewhere around 300 bucks. But, just like this, guess what? It's connected to the internet, it collects data, and it has artificial intelligence built into it to make it run. Very similar to what's happening right in front of our faces in ag today. Okay, but Terratil, if, if you want to buy something, if you've got a tech-focused family, Terratil might be something of interest to, to get for your garden or around your beds, around the house. This is Blue River. A lot of you probably have seen this, know about this, but John Deere purchased them. You know, again, one of the limitations to the Blue River technology is it works. They've been working down, down in Texas, what, for this, what, their third growing season? Uh, but it works at about three miles an hour, okay? But it can identify weeds and then spray those weeds. There's other technologies out there in Europe and Australia that you can go out and learn about. But this kind of spot, this seek and spray, spot spray, whatever you want to call it, is kind of here and starting to come. The question for all of us is, at least standing here today, or in this room is, can I do that at 10 miles an hour? Can I do that at 12? Can I do that at 15, right? That's our normal operating speeds a lot of times for this type of stuff. No. No, we're not quite there, but we're working to that type of capacity. If you look at Blue River, if you haven't heard, what, two years ago they started talking about this in cotton. Here's your cotton plants. Here's the weeds. Of course, it can, it can direct uh, herbicide right to those weeds based on the type of weed. But basically, they were talking about you know, it works. It works at a very small, uh, very slow pace today, but it reduced post planting products by 90%. 90%. You, get, you basically are only using 10% of the product that you normally use to, to cover the entire field. So this stuff is coming. I mean, there's a real, in, you know, um, uh, focus on this. Autocart by Smart Ag. Anyone seen this? Anyone go to Farm Progress show this year? They, had, they were doing a demo with this. This is really one of the real first commercially available autonomous solutions here in the U.S. If you want to go invest in this, you can today, technically. They, I think they're still kind of working out some bugs. But uh, they're a, a basically a startup company out of Ames, Iowa. 
Uh, this is kind of their second. We had one working in Ohio this year um, during this recent harvest. But uh, this is another example. So you want to kind of keep up with what they're doing. They have yet to... Uh, so, and if you saw what Raven did a couple weeks ago, you know, they bought Dot. That's another company offering robotics, okay? But Raven's buying up some of these companies. Again, from the Thomas perspective, it's here. All right, it's starting to get here for, for us sitting in this room to buy this stuff. This is another example. I'd be more in tune to watch this. This is a company out of Australia called Swarm Farm. I encourage you to keep up with Swarm Farm if you're interested in where kind of the future, what happens. Uh, they're expanding. They continue to do development work, but the idea is you have multiple small robots working together out in the field. You see that in that picture. Kind of a different looking machine, different management of machinery. But they seem to be making inroads and to some of these starting to grow. But they basically have this standardized platform where they can, they can put, but I would keep an eye on them as they progress and see what's happening, okay? Also, these are companies that are cropping up. Tranus is one. Again, I'm out here advocating up front here on it. Tranus is just one that uh, had the opportunity to be around a little bit. We have two consultants in, uh, in Ohio that during this season, the 19th season, that offered services using this solution. But the idea very simply is it'll do population counts for you based on using drones. They fly about 50 feet and it'll do things like vegetative cover. Uh, they, they say they're doing insects, okay, and they can identify insects, identify weeds, and ultimately nutrient deficiencies. In particular, in our neck of the woods, what our consultants are doing are basically doing, thinking about not sending people to the field. I think that's the perspective here is. You actually allow the drone to go to the field and collect certain types of data, in this case, stand counts, look at thresholds and uh, insects, things like that. To me, that's the mentality, that's where we're heading with some of this, is we'll still have someone that manages those devices, again, that are kind of robotic, but they're gonna be collecting a lot of data in a very short fashion that ultimately will be new data resources that can come out, okay? My opinion is scouting is going to take a new look in the future and the likelihood of some of you going to the field is going to be minimized in the very near future. But you guys are going to have to be managers of these in order to deploy and take advantage of it. Just thinking about what your business may look like in the, in the near future. Tranus again is one example. Artificial intelligence is here. This is one example. This is a 2019 New Holland Combine. Again, think about this very simply. It's in planner technology today too for some of you that are using maybe some of the high tech stuff. But the idea that the technology begins to adjust itself based on the conditions, field conditions of the day. It does that automatically, okay? That's here. And continues, the companies continue to work on art of AI and be embedding that technology into some of the machineries. So in the near future, probably for some of us, you're going to have AI built into the machine and you may not even recognize it's there. But it will be controlling what happens on that machine to some level. What's being out there? Like I said, planners, the combine, how to create prescription maps is using our artificial intelligence. We've got some companies out there, if you haven't seen, doing uh, verberate tillage per se. Prescription tillage, that's, that's using AI based on surface residue, clod size, even soil color they're looking at. Uh, fertility tools are getting AI embedded into them. Probably some of you know what, what I'm talking about there. And some of these weather field accessibility tools that are out there, are several companies that are offering that. Again, all have artificial intelligence built in to look at the weather and, and the conditions more locally to try and prescribe kind of red light, green light scenarios. If you don't believe me and you're interested in this stuff, go out and look at patents that companies have acquired and you'll notice in those patents that artificial intelligence is mentioned as part of that technology. There's several patents out there, a good number. Here's one, just an example. This is a project we did and have uh, reported, actually put out in the literature. 
I'm just getting you to think here. But on the left side, very simply, is the yield map off of the combine. On the right side is the yield map we created in July. Similarities? My point in this, and you see some other evidence from that out being embedded in some of the quote platforms I was talking about. You're going to see some of this in the future at some point. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm just saying we're starting to get in a phase where data, data warehousing, give us the capacity to start to look at artificial intelligence. I'm giving you that in our study, we were able to pretty high confidence create a yield map early in the season. Granted, there's a lot that can happen between July and October. I will admit that. Weather, for you guys, you know, some kind of hurricane, whatever, can happen. I get that. But the point is, the predictability is there and can be updated. But come July, at least in corn, we're getting high confidence on what the yield map's going to look like or projected to look like early. Okay? So just, again, get you thinking about what's, what's capacity, capabilities that are out there coming up. With that, two things, and uh, what how much time we have? Great. Um, I don't know how many, anyone in here using uh, Smart Firmer? Smart Firmer? I tell you, is in Ohio, a lot of farmers are trying to get their hands on them. 18 was kind of hard to get, it, some people got it, but it was pretty limited in terms of, I would, I'm prescribing and I know I'm an academic and good in trouble. I think this is going to actually revolutionize how we approach the field. A lot of them are using four on a, on a, typically it's going to be a 60 foot planter roughly. 40, 60 foot is pretty popular in our neck of the woods. So putting four on is kind of common. So you're not doing every row, but you, you kind of spread it out over the planter. You know, as you look, what I would tell you is very quickly in 19, what happened was most of our farmers were adjusting their seeding depth based on the sensor. So immediately, in my book, immediately that sensor was impacting how that planter was set up. I can tell you, uh, we were running on a 60-foot planter with a farmer doing some research. Um, and before we got into the project area, the plot area, that's how it, we were adjusting. We had thought that the planter was set up, you know, just like it was last year, planting corn at two inches. We used it and make, basically made an a adjustment to... to, to to get us down to basically a two inch, but it was a sensor that drove us to get out of the cab and spend a little more time getting it set up. So to, to me, that was a direct impact from that. Now, for some of you, you get this organic matter, sen you know, moisture, organic matter. I'm just saying that I think it's going to revolutionize what we think about as we pull that planter across the field. We had a couple of guys that I know of or confirmed they were actually adjusting the seating rates on the go. You can do that. I don't know how that came out. We weren't part of those projects, but I can tell you they were they were using it in that capacity. We're doing that in our area. <clears throat> and it's, it's one of those things we're looking at moisture and we're looking at organic matter as we're going across the field and making our decision at that point on what, what we're doing as far as population goes. It's not much of a change. I think the most drastic change I've seen is like three or 4,000 on the population change. Um, but in areas where you think previously there's no seeding up in the population here, this has been our first year really doing that, so we haven't looked at field data yet to see exactly what benefits there were, but it'll be interesting to see. Let me ask you this, though, to my point, but has it changed your, your ideas about how you might go to the field and plant? Oh, without a doubt. Yep. And I, I think that's a consistent perspective on everyone and why they, this, everyone would like to get these on their plant. A lot, I wouldn't say everyone. Let me rephrase that. Those that are in the tech space and really trying to drive what, what I'm trying to accomplish and I'm interested in variable seeding, those kinds of things, it's having a drastic change in their mindset as you go to the, to the field. That's my opinion. But I think it's an IoT device, right? If you really think about it, this is connected to the Internet. I can not only see it real time in a cab, but, you know, I can be remote. If you let me have access to your climate field view account, I could be watching it as well. So just be thinking about that. The other notion, and again, I go back to this whole connected field. So that's a connected field, in my opinion. We're connecting the field up, going back to my earlier connected farm picture. 
And now we got these things. And again, this is just one example of people trying to put devices that go beyond just kind of moisture and temperature. But now, aeration, phosphorus, nitrate, looking at that change over time by depth. Again, this is something new coming out. You're starting to see companies trying to work on these prototypes, be able to deliver this, but the idea that I'm just not doing moisture and temperature, but there's going to be these other variables that are kind of suitably going to be monitored over the growing season. I'll have data, per se, that comes back that I can look at, and maybe, maybe, if you're doing things like split applications of nitrogen or you're doing other things of that nature in season, they, these things may inform my strategy of what I do, how I do it, and how much I do. I mean, remote sense imagery is one thing, but you start deploying things that give you ground truthing at a level, I think it's going to impact how we think about some of this in season. Okay? Again, an IoT device coming, or these companies are, are pushing. And again, I go back to this, and I'm going to leave on this, this note. We are, this whole digital thing's happening so fast. And you can agree or disagree with me. I'm telling you, things are happening. If you haven't seen over the last two weeks since Agrotechnica, all the announcements, we're working with this company, we're buying this company, whatever that is, that all centers around the discussions, basically, and information I presented here today. This is positioning to provide next age digital technologies to farmers. Okay, what I would tell you here is, and, and we've been very adamant, I think as farmers and I think as consultants helping farmers, that it's time to have what I describe as a digital strategy in play. And, and why I say that is most people, and I be included in our household, I can't even tell you all the technologies we're using in our household, but just understanding what the suite of technology is being used in that farm what data can be collected or is being collected on the farm, what percentage of that data is being kind of used or thought about being used, and what am I sharing out of those data streams, where am I storing that data, and I haven't talked about this yet, but if you're serious about participating in this, the industry, you know, when you put the thumb drive in a display and download that data to, to that thumb drive, that'll be the last time you ever see that type of data because you're going to probably hand it off or you're going to give it to someone that gets put up into one of these platforms. How many of you are taking that data right there and archiving that because in three years you go to a precision ag service and you say, hey, I need the last four years of your yield data. Well, they want what's on that thumb drive, not what's coming out of some platform and you don't know how it's been translated, typically. Does that make sense? And so it's becoming important if you think data sharing, you think using these tools, and you want to think about having value is a simple digital strategy in play that includes archiving that display data, I would recommend. Where is that? By year, by farm, however you want to do it. But just having that at your disposal, knowing where it is, becomes important. How am I going to share data? Am I going to email it to you? Am I going to use a cloud service? Am I going to share it out of my climate account, my John Deere? I mean, that's a, these are things that are cropping up and are, are painful for some people to interact with today. And so I just think that we're at a point where this digital strategy, let alone all the agreements that you're entering into or not knowing that you're entering into to make this all work, but having that, a simplified one on the farm becomes pretty important today in my book. So... With that, I encourage you, if you want to see results like from the planner and other things, we're working on our 19 version right now, but digitalagosu.eu eFields has a lot of some of our agronomic stuff to technology stuff. Uh, there's an online book. If you're interested in a hard copy, email me and, and let me know. But that's where we're, we're publishing all of our, we're trying to get as much information out. Our 19 book will be out January 8th. That's the plan. We'll have it out January 8th of 2020 here. For 19. With that, we got a few minutes for questions. Yeah, good time. Time for questions. It's Thursday morning, third day here. Everyone's any questions, comments? Not. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you sitting through this.